If you take melatonin, you need to hear this. We've been told that melatonin is the safest sleep supplement that is out there. Then why did this brand new study, this major study with 130,000 people, just link melatonin usage to a 90% increased risk of heart failure? This is something that we need to understand because melatonin is popular and a lot of people depend on it for sleep. In this video, first we're going to cover the study findings, what this study actually found, what we're looking at dead on. Next, we will look at how melatonin actually works in the body so that we can understand some maybe mechanistic detail as to why the study may have found what it found. Then thirdly, we will tap into the limitations of the study, the concerns, and really what we need to know. And then fourthly, we will talk about other ways that you can improve your sleep if you don't want to use melatonin based on what we've just discovered. Before I get into the study details, I put a link down below for something that might help you sleep, and it's kind of backwards from what you might think. Creatine. Creatine can help you sleep. And it does so because it helps with these energy reserves that actually allow your body to recover a little bit better and consequently can reduce the inflammation that allows you to get into a deeper state of sleep. So I put a link down below for my favorite creatine. It's a company called Create. So that link down below gets you up to 54% off their creatine gummies that are sweetened with allulose. So it cancels out some of the carbohydrates that are in the gummies, making them quite unique. Anyhow, so that link is down below. It gets you up to 54% off. So it's a really screaming discount on some of the best creatine that's on the market and the one that I personally use. So that link is down below. So this study was presented at the American Heart Association Scientific Sessions, and it was just released early November 2025. This looked at 130,800 people, and it was a preliminary study, so it has not been peer-reviewed yet. So we're just looking at early data with it, but it's pretty interesting and quite shocking. This study looked at adults that had insomnia and were taking melatonin for over 12 months, meaning they had melatonin in their electronic health record in their actual chart. So it, it could have been a prescribed version of melatonin, or it could have been where their insomnia was severe enough to where it was noted in their medical chart that they took melatonin. And they compared this to not regular people, but to other people with insomnia that did not have melatonin in their chart. So essentially what they were trying to do was make it nice and fair, looking at two groups, large groups of people that had insomnia, one group that would take melatonin, and one group that did not. So what if it was actually the melatonin causing the problem and not the insomnia? Because we know that insomnia is problematic. We know insomnia is linked with stroke, linked with heart disease. It's linked with all kinds of issues, increased parasympathetic tone, increased cortisol, you name it, the condition and it's associated with insomnia. And the worse your insomnia, the worse those conditions. But what if it was the melatonin that was actually causing these issues? What did the study find? It found that there was a 90% increased risk of heart failure in those that took the melatonin compared to those that didn't. A 4.6% instance of heart failure compared to a 2.7% risk of heart failure. But not only that, there was a 3.5x increased hospitalization in the group that took melatonin compared to the group that did not, and a 1.8x increase in all-cause mortality. Could it be that the potential hormone suppression from melatonin usage was causing downstream effects that were negative? Could it have pro-oxidative effects? Well, we have to understand a little bit about how melatonin works. And in a couple of minutes, I'm going to explain some of the major pitfalls with this study that change everything from what the mainstream media has been broadcasting. Melatonin works by being a circadian tuner. It is not a sedative. It does not just knock you out and make you go to sleep. It aligns your circadian rhythm, okay? Now, another thing, melatonin is a very powerful antioxidant. So when we go to sleep and melatonin is released, it actually serves as what's called a mitochondrial antioxidant, actually mopping up some of the stress and the oxidative stress that happened throughout the day. So it has a lot of benefits there. Now, melatonin helps with sleep onset. It does not necessarily help you stay asleep. As a matter of fact, the half-life of melatonin is only like 40 minutes to an hour. It doesn't last long. So it usually helps people fall asleep. A lot of times people that take melatonin will fall asleep and then they'll actually wake up later in the night. And sometimes that's really difficult for people with insomnia because they create this illusion that they are sleeping better because their sleep onset is better. But then they still wake up or have disrupted cycles or sleep cycles throughout the rest of the night. So could that be the problem? Could it be that people that take melatonin are actually getting worse sleep? 
I think we need to understand exactly what the study limitations were so that we can paint a clearer picture here. The big problem, this study looked at people with insomnia. And once again, if you have insomnia, you are already at significantly increased risk of heart conditions. But they compared insomnia people to other insomnia people. So then what's the deal here? The biggest thing here, and this is a huge, huge, huge thing, they did not account for unmeasured variables. What that means in simple human terms is they took a group of people that had insomnia and took melatonin and statistically matched them with a twin that was dealing with insomnia, but not taking melatonin. Well, what the study doesn't show is that people that have been taking melatonin for a year or more, and it's in their chart, are probably dealing with significantly more severe insomnia than people that don't have melatonin in their chart. Let me paint a picture for you. You go to the doctor. You say, I'm dealing with some insomnia. I'm not sleeping well. I haven't been sleeping well for the last couple of months. The doctor says, okay, well, here's some things to do. You know, let's just kind of continue on. Compare that to you've been going to the doctor for years complaining about insomnia to the point that they are prescribing you melatonin at a clinical dose. You're advising them that you're taking melatonin. They're probably prescribing other things, Ambien, other sleep aids, we're talking a different situation. So by the time melatonin is in your electronic health record, it implies that you're probably at a much more severe state of insomnia than someone that is just dealing with insomnia. Since this looks at people that have been taking for melatonin for 12 months or more, that means that they're repeatedly going to the doctor and this has been noted in their chart that they have insomnia. The other piece of the equation is that melatonin is over the counter. So just because they're not having it in their medical chart doesn't mean they're not taking melatonin. So it says people that are dealing with insomnia but don't take melatonin. They didn't ask these people. It's not self-reported. It's based on what's in their electronic health record. There's things I don't always tell my doctor. Maybe it's on purpose, maybe it's not. But the point is, is not everyone's gonna tell their doctor they're taking melatonin. That might only come up if it's really a serious discussion. They could just be having insomnia but not actually telling their doctor that they're taking melatonin and there's nothing to regulate that good or bad or ugly. Like there's just a lot of variables and this is a perfect classic example of reverse causation. Of course, someone that has more severe insomnia is going to have increased cortisol, increased sympathetic tone, increased inflammation, increased cytokine storm, increased risk of stroke, increased risk of heart failure, increased risk of dementia. Do you want me to continue to go on? The more severe the insomnia, it is absolutely dose dependent. The other thing we also have to remember is that the more severe the insomnia, the more severe the protocols. They're probably taking other things. They're probably self-medicating. They might even be drinking alcohol to medicate. Okay, the more severe, the more things they're adding on. Melatonin is just the canary in the coal mine. And the data and the authors of this study even disclose quite clearly that this is very correlational, that we don't have the solid data to prove it. We certainly don't have the mechanistic data as a matter of fact, I had Dr. Dom Diagostino on my channel recently, and we were talking about this. He's a neuropsychopharmacologist, and he is talking about how melatonin is a powerful antioxidant that has benefits. Now, I want to give you some tools because I have to fall on the sword and be real here. I'm not the biggest melatonin fan. The reason I'm not the biggest melatonin fan is, like I mentioned earlier, it helps people fall asleep, but a lot of times they'll wake up a few hours later, and it can disrupt their sleep architecture. I'm a firm believer that some people respond well to melatonin and others do not. Do I believe it's causing a heart failure? <laughs> it's unlikely. And this study is definitely reverse causation and clearly a correlational study. But it doesn't mean that I love melatonin. I just want to be a voice of a reason here. So here's a few things that you can do to improve your sleep if you don't want to take melatonin or even in addition to melatonin. Three grams of glycine about 30 minutes to an hour before bed has an amazing effect on cooling your body. So it increases your natural melatonin response. By doing this, your body can fall asleep quite a bit easier, but it has a neurotransmitter effect that actually lowers cortisol and keeps you calm throughout the night. So it prevents those sort of anxiety wakings that you get where you're like, oh my gosh, I sit up out of bed and I have to do so much stuff tomorrow and I forgot to do this today and I can't get back to sleep. It calms that because it acts as a neurotransmitter. It is also a neuromodulator. 
And again, keeps you cool so you fall asleep faster. Nice little benefit. It also calms your bladder so you don't feel you have to get up to pee. Magnesium and the amount of four to 500 milligrams binds to what is called the NMDA receptor, which has a very calming GABAergic effect. Makes your brain in that more calm, relaxed, rest and digest state rather than the turned on glutamate state where you're fired up and ready to rock. A little bit of grounding before bed. This can lower cortisol. And we've seen this in salivary cortisol tests. We've seen it in inflammatory markers. Just getting on the concrete, not asphalt because asphalt doesn't conduct concrete, dirt, grass. Sounds crazy, but touching some grass for a while has an effect when it comes down to free electrons and being able to calm your body a bit. Now, the evidence is, I wouldn't even say it's a mixed bag. It's just we haven't put a lot of money into that because where's the financial incentive to tell people to go stand on grass if you catch my drift? Okay, but that is an important one. Also, cracking a window, getting fresh air. We have studies that show that higher levels of CO2 that build in the uh, bedroom will cause you to sleep less, right? So get some fresh air circulating. It can increase that a lot. Two to 400 milligrams of theanine. Theanine crosses the blood-brain barrier calms the body, calms the brain. And here's an interesting hack if you're dealing with stress. Not that I just want to throw supplements at you, but it's one that you could try if you need a quick stopgap. Phosphatidylserine. Very interesting, and it helps protect the phospholipid bilayer of our cells, which is great because it helps combat against oxidative stress from the day, but there's also a lot of evidence showing that it is a temporary break on cortisol. So if you're really having a stressful day, you could take one to 300 milligrams of phosphatidylserine, and it helps calm your body and blunts the cortisol, which could be throwing off your entire diurnal rhythms. It's less about just being calm and more about not having these inadequate or cattywampus sort of cortisol rhythms throughout the day. Now, I did a video here that breaks down how to use glycine specifically if you're someone that has to pee in the middle of the night. That was me. I would have to pee and then I would never fall back asleep. So this video breaks down really well on how to use glycine and why it works in that case. So check that video out. And as always, Keep it locked in here. I'll see you tomorrow.